um, Paul Hardy did more talk going on. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the Exchange Cafe. Um, it's a, a platform for supporting regional conversations about climate change challenges and solutions in Tairakutu. Uh, the Exchange Cafe is supported by Rotopita Water, uh, the Tairakutu Environment Centre, uh, Gisborne District Council, and our um, major funder is Trust Tairakutu. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Shama Beal Yaakob. Shama Beal is an experienced economist who makes economics easy. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, he is an author, column, columnist, media commentator, and a thought leading public speaker. He has a, over a decade of experience as an economist in Wellington, Melbourne, and Auckland, and leading international banks and consultancy. He is a, are you still a partner at Sense? He was until recently a partner <laughs> at Sense Partners, a boutique economic consultancy. Shama Beal lives in Auckland with his wife and son. He grew up in Canterbury and holds a BCom with honours in economics from Lincoln University. Um, so welcome Shama Beal. Thanks, <clears throat> Uh, Kira and Maureen, everybody. Look, it's really great to be here. Um, I've done a, a bit of work in the region, mainly around the housing issue in Gisborne and, um, and in Wairoa. And to me, one of the big things was how unprepared we seem to be when things change suddenly. And the reality is life is going to become more unpredictable. What we're seeing with the weather, what we're seeing with climate change, what we're seeing with demographics is that we have less certainty of the future. And those risks that we face are bigger, they're stronger, they're more frequent. So what do we do in that environment and how do we change our mindsets and what kinds of things should we ask for? And when we talk about economic development, it is a lot about that. What is the backdrop that we're working against? And what are the kinds of uh, mindsets and ways of working that we need to think about? Um, a lot of the work that happens in psychology um, focuses on words like fragility and resilience. But when it comes to regions, it's not enough to take a personal perspective. We have to take a regional perspective and a community perspective. And the word that we need to think about is anti-fragility. When things happen, because things do happen, how do we become more strong? How do we become stronger as a result of those experiences and stresses? So I just leave you as, as that as the starting thought, that what we're talking about today is actually a much wider collective conversation about what are we actually trying to achieve? Not that we can stop the risks from happening, but when those risks and stresses appear, how can we, as a result of that, as a community, come closer together and be stronger and do better next time it happens? So keep that in the back of your mind, because um, I think um, quite a lot of what is happening around the world is quite frightening at the moment. And I don't know how to use this. Oh, that big button. The big button does like me. <laughs> Uncertainty. This is what happens. Roll with the punches, right? So the, the back, backdrop to this is um, I gave a talk at, um, um, in Hawke's Bay after the, after the cyclone. And I do this every three years. Um, the friends of the Hawke's Bay Libraries invite me every uh, three years to come and give a talk. And they raise funds. So that's my bit of good work for the year. And um, the question was very pertinent, right? Like, what do we do? So what can I, as an economist, tell you that you don't already know? You've already experienced this. You've already recovered. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a step back and give you a bit of wider perspective in terms of how I would think about it. And it is one perspective rather than the only perspective. But I think one thing that really comes through when you take a step back and think about what we are experiencing right now is this is just more of everything. Doesn't it feel like it? The things are just coming at us in wave after wave after wave, and it feels relentless. We've had COVID, we've had the big cost of living crisis, we've had the, the wrath of nature, we've got war, literally war that's taking place around the world. How unprecedented in terms of experiencing this in our lifetimes in this moment of time, when we thought we would be progressing towards a more peaceful, more stable, more prosperous future. And what we're experiencing, of course, is also that these risks and shocks that we experience are more severe and more frequent. And this more, more, more 
is really telling us that, you know, when we talk about normal curves, you know, you remember learning that at school? Those tails are getting fatter. Those extreme circumstances, those extreme things that are very rare are now less rare and less more severe. And for us, the question becomes, what, is, what do we do as a result of it? And we've seen this in cr multiple crises in New Zealand and elsewhere. When something really big happens, we're very good at pulling together and going, there is a crisis, we must respond. Good, because people need that help. But what next? What lesson did we learn and what did we change so that one, it doesn't happen, or if it does happen, how can we do better? That bit is very weak in New Zealand. And one example of that is after the earthquakes in Canterbury, we did an extraordinary job of looking after people. We even rebuilt the city in a relatively quick time. But we made no changes to the processes of emergency management. That meant that when we had the floods and when we had the cyclones, we still had to create special emergency legislation to respond to a crisis that is, of course, always going to happen. How short-sighted and how unlearned we are in the way that we do public policy. So keep that again in the back of your mind, that we keep doing a good job in a crisis, but we do nothing to prepare ourselves better for the next one. And in fact, it's that bit that we need to focus on. The politics I'm really disheartened by, not because of who's in power, because I think politicians are much the same, but more because politics is diving towards this short-termism, this divisiveness, and that worries the hell out of me. If you think about how governments create good social outcomes, it's by stopping bad things happening, by doing more good things, and creating unity. I do not think you can look back over the course of the last decade and agree that we have been building enough unity to be able to actually have successful democracies in the way that we would envision it. So I'm really quite concerned that the political, political backdrop is moving towards short-termism, reactionism, and divisiveness. And that makes it much harder for governments to be successful. And if it's not going to happen in Wellington, we must try and do something about it here. We can't all influence and change those big tides, big waves that are taking over general you know, po political consensus around the world, right? This is not just us that's experiencing. We're just 10 years behind Trump. And I'm not calling Chris uh, Trump, but uh, the reality is that those waves of political changes, I think, are sweeping around the world, and this is not unusual. So again, keep that in the back of your mind of, you know, if there's short-termism that's affecting what's happening in Wellington, how do we create long-termism here? Because in our communities, we can do that. That's the difference, is we are local. It is our place. We will still be here when Wellington's government changes in three years' time. What are we going to do that's different? So the implications are very much around, I think, that very strong focus on values. And I know it's very easy to talk about values. And I'll show you a picture later on some work I did with Tuhoi. But what we picture as success has to be clear and articulate. Because quite often, the things that we say, our words, mean different things to different people. And that really matters. If we can't get the clarity and the unity, we will not be able to move forward. <clears throat> And the focus on what we control, right? Yes, there's a change of government. We can't control that. But what we do know is there's $1.4 billion that Shane Jones is going to spend. Let's get a slice of that, right? So let's focus on the kinds of things we can do, which is about putting together a regional plan that is coordinated with consensus. And we go asking for one thing. And we don't have any infighting in the region saying, oh, that plan is no good. Do this one, right? And we saw this with the PGF, which was an extraordinary weakness. We saw people within the same region fighting against each other for money. And not necessarily saying that happened here, but I've seen it in lots of places around New Zealand where they fought against each other going, nah, that project is crap, fund my one. That's really problematic because what we want to do is we want to create a plan that works for our whole region rather than for one business or for one industry. So what's the context? And part of the context is, um, I don't know if you guys know, I'm quite infamous in Whanganui. Um, I called it a zombie town one time. And the timing was perfect, because after not growing for 20 years, as soon as I called it a zombie town, it started growing, right? Immediately. I think just to spite me. But the reality is something actually changed. Right after I wrote that book about uh, regional decline, all the regions started to grow a lot. And part of it was because there were employment opportunities in the regions, but also because life became so hostile 
in our big urban centers. The cost of living, the congestion, the quality of life has actually been falling for a lot of people. If you're not working in a flash job, living in Auckland sucks. But if you have lots of money, it's wonderful, right? So there is this weird kind of dichotomy and we are exporting people like there is no tomorrow. So I don't know if you know this, but Auckland loses more people to the provinces than it gets and has been doing that since the early 1990s. And the beneficiaries are widespread, including places like Tarifiti. So that's why I say this is voting with, with feet. Like people have been voting with their feet and coming here, right? And what is really unusual is if you look at the, the, the track record of our population here, you look at that, this is going back to 1960. I've got data that goes back to like 1930s, right? And essentially there's this kind of this long period where the population of this region didn't really grow. And then, boom. But look at those dotted lines. Those are the forecasts, right? And this is why you shouldn't listen to economists and uh, forecasters very much, because we have no idea, right? Because essentially, when we were here in 2008, 2009, when I was writing my book, the expectation was that our population would continue to decline because we were exporting our young people, because we're getting older. So of course, the place would shrink. And then you see what happened. It just went kaboom, right? Now, it's wonderful that people want to live here. But it's only wonderful if we have the homes and the infrastructure and the services to be able to support it. If we can't respond, if we're not responsive to that increase in people voting with their feet to be here, what we create is this extraordinary pressure on people who are here first. It's a new kind of colonization and that's quite problematic. And when you see what happens here, the, the big flip comes from first in about 2008, 2009, we see regional net migration coming positive, right? So people from other parts of New Zealand start to come to Gisborne. Sorry, sir, am I anyway? Can you see? Yeah. Cool. But then also more recently, we've had net migration from international sources as well. And that partly reflects that we're not losing as many people overseas as we used to, but also people are coming in because there are specific labor shortages and skill shortages in the region that we're filling with immigration. Now, as an immigrant, I can tell you it's wonderful for us to be able to give them the opportunity, but it's also true that we have people here who are not given the skills and the training to take part of the opportunities that we're meeting with immigration. There is a laziness to relying on immigration as your solution to labor shortages. And I'd put that at the feet of our education system and our businesses who are too lazy to invest in their people and to actually create the long-term supply of uh, workers. So there are some really big tasks in front of us, and part of it has to be about us holding up the mirror and going, why is it that we always need to import people from elsewhere to be able to fill our workers? Why do we have vacancies that we didn't prepare for? Why do we have vacancies that we don't work with our education systems to upskill? These are actually really hard questions because when you hold the mirror up, you go, because I have failed, because I'm not a very good business person, because I'm weak. And nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to experience that. It's hurtful. So <clears throat> what has happened in, um, in, in this region is we actually used to be relatively weak in terms of our economic performance, right? So this is a, I don't know if any of you guys play with the economic data, but Gisborne always gets tied in with Hawke's Bay, as if we're the same. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, you know, this huge geography, but now we're just going to lump it together. It's much the same. Outrageous. But anyway. When you look at the actual what's happening in this region in terms of the share of the population that's employed, that's in the green line, you can see that in that period through the kind of the early 2010s, um, we had far less employment as a share of the population than New Zealand. And then performance really picked up. So we actually had quite decent economic growth. We had businesses that were growing. We had jobs that were being created. And that was the reason why people were coming. And we saw that really improving. But you can also see that over the course of the last two years, our economy has actually been slowing while the rest of New Zealand has been growing. So it's not true that the, everything that happens at New Zealand happens here. We are a unique place that has unique things and drivers that affect us. And so if you think about what's happened over the course of the last decade, we had about 3,000 jobs that were created in our region. But if we had grown at the same rate as New Zealand, we would have grown our jobs by about 5,500. Can you see? So that's a big gap, right? So we are underperforming in some parts. And when you look at it by industry, quite a lot of it is about the performance within our industries. So you know, there, is, there are some challenges and constraints that we face here that for our economic development plan, we need to ask, what are the levers? What are the constraints? What are the things that are stopping us from growing as fast as everybody else? Why? Why is it happening? So I don't know the answer, but we can ask that question with the businesses that are here. 
You know, the difference between here and Auckland is you can literally pick up the phone and find the person who's, who's responsible for that. Right in Auckland, I'm going to have to talk to like 500 people. Whereas here, we know that roughly the people, and some of them are in this room, who are responsible and who are the knowledgeable ones. So there is a real beauty to smaller regions where we have the networks and connections, the closeness and proximity, to be able to actually understand what's happening and what to do about it, if we do it with a high trust model. Now, I'm quite obsessed about housing because I think if you don't have a safe place to call home, life is not good. Right? It's that fundamental thing that you've got to have a little place somewhere you feel safe and comfortable to be able to succeed. And the reality is that we haven't done a very good job of that. And you can see that in terms of the wait list for public housing. You can see that in terms of housing stress. But the real reason for that is essentially we had this period from about 2011, 2012, when the population growth was so fast that we could not keep up with the houses that we built. And we don't build a lot of houses, right? We build somewhere between 100 and 200 houses a year in Gisborne. It's not enough, right? We should be building 500 houses a year. But for that, you need to have infrastructure, you need to have land, you need to have connectivity, you need to have density. But if you're going to have density, why the hell do you want to live in Gisborne? You may as well live in Auckland, right? So there is this weird tension between the things that we need to do are actually not why people want to live here. And how do we find that connection and uh, that uh, trade-off? So the difficulty for us is that it's so unpredictable about when people will come. When I wrote that book, we were confident that the population of Gisborne would shrink. We were wrong. So if you followed that plan, you wouldn't have invested in your infrastructure, you wouldn't have invested in your land use, you wouldn't have planned for that growth. And so when the growth turns up, you're completely unprepared. And the consequences, we don't have enough homes, our cost of housing goes up, our cost of rentals go, goes up, and we create this huge amount, of, um, huge amount of uncertainty in the community. And that uncertainty really comes through in terms of the cost of living, right? So on that sort of green line is the average income from jobs in, in the region, and on the gray line is the rents for an average place in Gisborne. And you can see why people are struggling, right? The cost of living, cost of housing has just gone up exponentially over the course of the last, uh, last five years. And that flows through the fact that we have people who are couch surfing, who are overcrowded, who are living in suboptimal conditions, but also means people just have less money to spend. And the reality is when people have less money to spend, your economy is not going to be as strong, which is exactly what we see in terms of what happened in our region is, you know, if, if you think about this real sp uh, retail spending, which is a good kind of proxy for are people feeling, do people have enough income to kind of uh, spend more? And essentially you saw that kind of that, you know, that strong performance through that period between 2015 and through the middle of the pandemic. So things were volatile through the pandemic years, but by and large was pretty good. But then since about the middle of 2021, we've actually been coming off. So just telling you the story that, you know, sometimes because the data for our region is quite often mixed in with other places, it's hard to see what's happening here it's really important we take a really clear-eyed view of what's going on here and make sure that we're not swayed by the stories of New Zealand because the stories of New Zealand are not what's happening to our people and to our community. We must have a local lens. Um, this is a more national story, but I just wanted to explain to you that the, the cost of living pressures that are taking place are affecting some groups more than others and in different times and with different consequences. So for renters, for the typical renting household, they're, they used to kind of save somewhere between, I don't know, 10 and $20 a week before the kind of the pandemic, right? In the early part of the pandemic, it was okay. And then wages didn't rise very much, but the cost of living started to go up. And they had to find money. And so they went from saving a little bit of money to having to now cut their budgets, right? Now, for renters, it's not a big deal because they're used to it, right? Because they're used to having no control over their cost of housing, and they're, not, they're used to having relatively moderate income growth because they tend to work in jobs that are not very high paying. But for people who are mortgage holders, by and large, they're the, they're the aspiring middle classes, right? They feel okay, they feel, they feel comfortable and well off. And they were. So pre the, pre the pandemic, they were saving you know, close to about $50 a week. And then when the pandemic started, interest rates practically became free, right? Two and a half percent mortgage rates. And they were like, woohoo, I'm rich. And people were saving like 100 bucks a week. And then the cost of living started to increase. But mortgage rates were still fixed, so they were able to get by okay. 
But now that those mortgages are coming up for refinancing, we're seeing people who are previously comfortable now all of a sudden uncomfortable. And their budget is gone from a saving of $50, $100 a week to now having to cut by $100, $150, $200. When you move from that buffer of 100 bucks to having to find $250, $300 a week to pay your mortgage and feed your family, there's a real indignity in having to put things back from your supermarket trolley. All of a sudden, the middle classes feel this indignity and you see a lot of discomfort in your community from that. It's that kind of first brush with poverty for a lot of people. And they never thought it would happen to them. Poverty happens to other people, right? And that, that's, there's a middle class mentality that poverty is for other people. And when they experience it, it's really traumatic. And expect that to happen. This is the trauma that poor people feel all the time. All of a sudden, a new group of people are going to feel that, and you will see that in your community. And people will act out as a result of that. There'll be grumpiness in your community that makes it harder for people to engage. So this is not going to be the rich people who've paid off their mortgages or don't have mortgages. They're fine, right? Rich people are always fine. But the masses are renters and mortgage owners. And for those people, I think life is going to get pretty tough for the next little while. So just be mindful. It's your friends, your colleagues, your community that are experiencing this. So it gets harder to have some of those conversations when you're struggling for money. It's really hard to think about those long-term stuff because right now you're just drowning. You just want to just wanna grasp, to, grasp on anything that's there. Now, it's not just households that are struggling. It's the government as well, right? Um, it's in a weird way because governments can, can't actually be bankrupt, right? Because they can just tax you if they want to. So the difference is it doesn't really matter who's in power. Whenever there's a crisis in New Zealand, we borrow money. This is what happens, right? So this is the national government. They borrowed money for the global financial crisis and the Canterbury earthquakes. This is the Labour government. They borrowed money for COVID and then the floods and then the cyclone, which is fine, right? Because when a crisis happens, we should use that tool to be able to do that. Debt is not a fundamentally bad thing, but you should only use it for things that make you stronger or help you get through a crisis. And once the crisis is over, you should get your house back in order which is what we did not do. So if you look at what happened when um, the, you know, the last Labour government kind of left office. So you know, this is the crisis for New Zealand. So those of you who have grey hair will remember New Zealand was practically bankrupt in the 70s and early 80s. And we had massive problems with debt. And then with successive governments, right? And this is bipartisan in New Zealand. Successive governments got that down until a very low level in 2008. And that was, the, that was uh, Michael Cullen. He was the finance minister. I have a huge amount of respect for Michael Cullen as a finance minister because he held back the tide of demands to get your house in order, which allowed us to respond to the earthquake. But then we didn't really get things back in order before COVID hit, and we borrowed more money. What that tells us is that every time there's a new crisis, there is less room for us to be able to borrow money and get through. We might have maybe two, three more crises in our bag before we can't do this again. Right? So that's the context. So when we have climate crisis happening, they're going to happen all the time, right? We don't know when. We don't know how severe. We don't, that's completely unpredictable. But if you, if you agree with me that we only have two or three more crises left, that means that we'll get bailed out two or three more times. After that, you're on your own. There will be no socializing of the costs. The rest of New Zealand will not front up. Now, I still remember I was doing a lot of work in Canterbury after the earthquakes. And the first year was like, we love you, Canterbury. Second year was, we like you, Canterbury. Third year was, bugger off, Canterbury. You've had enough. It really was like that. It really was bugger off. You've had enough. We've already given you billions of dollars. How much more do you want? There is no endless well of empathy, right? The, the well of empathy can run dry. And so you just got to be really mindful that, yes, we still have those mechanisms in place. That's the old ways of doing things, but they will not last forever and they will run out. So <clears throat> this is a really geeky thing that I did in my last job. I currently I'm an unemployed bum, willingly. I quit my job because I was getting grumpy. I was like, I don't want to be a grumpy person. So um, I stopped working. But 
we did this piece of work when um, um, for Business New Zealand, and they, they were kind of asking, well, what, what's the state of politics in New Zealand? And so we're such geeks, right? We went back to the election in 1980 and all the elections since then, and looked at all the th policies that our different governments talked about. So the one I want you to focus on is just this red things that, that that's where the governments, the different large political parties, really differ on. They really differ on things like the size of government. They they disagree on things like labour market protections. Um, on asset sales, on centralization, but look at this one that's really coming to the fore, Treaty of Waitangi. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's coming through now that's actually a little bit new for New Zealand. They've always been hanging around in the backdrop, right? New Zealand's always had that undercurrent of racism and separatism that's quite, quite problematic. But I think that's really coming to the fore when it comes to the election that we're seeing now and around welfare. And we're also starting to see some real dis disagreements starting to come up around things like immigration policy and migration policy. So all I wanted to tell you is that when we think about our governments, there are some specific areas that they have a lot of disagreement on, but our governments by and large until now had been very vanilla. On 95% of things, they had the same ideas on everything. And so they fought really hard on you know, immigration or taxes or size of government and everything else was much the same. And that's interesting because it gives you a stable platform for most things to just get on with life. What we don't have at the moment, I think, that stability anymore. So the 2023 election, which is not in there, I think if you actually include all the minor parties who are in the coalition, we've got way more extreme stuff that's coming into the conversation. Lots more fragmentation and a lot more tension. And certainly on issues around social cohesion, I think those are the things that really concern me, that we've got these pressures on social cohesion that makes it harder for us to be able to continue that relative bipartisanship that we have experienced in New Zealand. So I'm actually really proud of the fact that, you know, and people who have worked in government will tell you that by and large we have very cordial relationships between our political parties. They can get in a room in a select committee and thrash things out and create good policy. I think it's going to get harder and harder when you become much more driven by culture wars. So the key issues for this government is going to be around coordination and cohesion within the coalition, right? Because it's like, you know, herding cats. Um, it is very much a focus on tax cuts and deregulation, which is fine if you knew what it was for. So there is this kind of this extraordinary thing. We just want tax cuts. Okay. And how will that make New Zealand better? Or we just, we just think our people can make better decisions. Fine, but which decisions? And there is a lack of specificity that's quite troubling because public policy should not be made like this. The difficulty for them is not so much that there are tax cuts because the reality is that our tax share of GDP has been going up. The difficulty is that we are at a time when we are experiencing quite high levels of debt and interest payments and cost pressures through you know, increases in wages for nurses, teachers, doctors. We want those things, right? We actually want to pay our critical staff really well because we want them to stay and we want them to be happy and not stressed and all those kinds of things. So those pressures are not going to go away. That means they're going to have to cut other things a lot more to be able to afford those tax cuts. And what is the consequence of that? And they haven't really contemplated that. So I worry about that and I think what's going to happen, there's going to be the short-termism in the way we do things. There's quite a lot of talk about centralization versus localization and governments over the years have been very good at centralizing the good stuff, which is your money and localizing the bad stuff, which is the regulation, right? Look at what local government has to do. Dog control, no, no, that's your job, right? Anything that's difficult, water, sewerage, infrastructure, these things were given to local government without funding and financing tools. It was deliberate in design. And it was not about a partisan story, right? This is not about a national government or a labor government or whatever, it's not about that. This is that central versus local. There is a real tension in trying to localize the problem stuff, the difficult stuff, and keeping the good stuff for themselves. And this is all happening against the backdrop of fiscal constraints, aging, climate change, and in my view, reduced social cohesion that we're seeing around the world. So I don't want you to think this is unique to New Zealand, and I don't want you to think it's inevitable, right? This reduced social cohesion is something that is absolutely solvable. In, and especially in New Zealand because we're literally our size of a village, right? Five million people in most countries is not even a state. But I also think it's going to be really hard to have stable governments in the future and stable policy making and ideologies in the future. And the reason I say this is if you think back to our past, there were really two big episodes when we had 
long-term policymaking. One was the building of the welfare state post-Second World War, and that was driven by the greatest generation. Because of the horrors of war and the poverty and all the terrible stuff they saw, they said, never again. We want to build a world that's different and a country that's different. And that's when we built the welfare state in New Zealand, right? You don't have to agree with all the policies, but the reality is that was their values, and they were the majority of voters for a long period of time, so they stand, stood the ground politically to implement the change. And then we kind of broke things, and I hold Muldoon responsible for a lot of bad stuff that's happened to this country. He shouldn't be so drunk so most of the time. But the reforms of the 1980s were absolutely necessary, right? Because our country was literally on the brink of default. But that change that we implemented, again, whether you agree or disagree, was sustained, implemented and sustained by the boomers because they were the great biggest share of the voters. And they were the biggest share until now. And in the future, there's not going to be one group who's going to be the dominant group anymore, right? Because society is becoming much more fragmented. And this really matters. This really matters because what we're likely to see is governments that are shorter in duration. And we're likely to see coalitions that are messy. We're likely to see demands that are more fragmented and less coordinated along party lines. And that makes it more difficult for you to have the long-term planning and long-term implementation of change, whatever it might be. So quite a lot of politics becomes about control Z, right? Undo. I want to undo what the last lot did rather than I want to build something on what the last lot did. So they're quite different things. And um, you know, again, people who have been through New Zealand's uh, politics and public sector will tell you quite a lot of our experience through the 90s was about building on change that had been done by others. Right? Despite political changes. And I think that's going to be really, really hard. So we are very much in that um, fat tails now. And I use the word anti-fragility as I used in the beginning is there is fragile, there is resilient, and then there's anti-fragile. Resilience is not enough. Resilience means you can respond to crises when they happen. Anti-fragile means that when a crisis happens, not only are we able to respond, we're able to learn and change. The learn and change is the most critical part of whatever plan we're going to cook up, right? If we're not able to be responsive to the changes that are required of our society, the next time we'll have even more people who are going to fall by the wayside. And I think we're going to see that in our community. I had to extend the chart on the, on the left-hand side. So that's the, the insurance payments for natural disasters, not including earthquakes. So this is the floods and storms and that kind of stuff. And it used to be around 0.1% of GDP, right? You couldn't even see it. And then I had to change my scale up to 0.7 because, the, and this was just for the first six months of the year. So literally we've increased our, the biggest claims, seven times the typical amount of insurance claims. What do you think our good friends in the insurance companies are going to do? <laughs> They're going to increase prices and stop insuring, absolutely. And so if I look at what's happened in New Zealand versus Australia, because what happened was Australia experienced a whole bunch of floods and storms in the last decade and their insurance costs have increased by more than 40%, by 40% more than New Zealand. Guess how much our insurance premiums are rising by this, this, by, by this year? 40%. These guys know how to pay, make you pay, right? Now, we already experienced this in our community with the cyclone. We had very high rates of households who did not have insurance. What do you think is going to happen when insurance costs go up by another 40%? I'm really, really concerned that what we're experiencing is we are going to have climate change response done to us rather than us doing it for ourselves. And that is really quite frustrating because when insurance companies go, I will not insure this area, mm. what happens is you create ghettos. And I say this with full honesty and sincerity because that is exactly what happened in Louisiana. That, you know, that the, the, the words on the wrong side of the levee mm. means a thing because that's the side of the levee that floods. That's the side of the levee where poor people live. That's the side of the levee you can't get insurance. When you create ghettos like that, what do you think happens to your social cohesion? What do you think happens to your society? So these are not just questions of insurance. These are not just questions of climate change. These are not just questions of storms. These are actually bigger questions about society and community and cohesion and those kinds of things. A lot of the conversation and efforts to date around climate change has been around mitigation. Absolutely, we should try and do these things because that's for our future generations, right? We're killing the planet. We should stop doing that. But adaptation has been something we've done very little on. The reason for that is most of the adaptation stuff happens locally. 
Because what does adaptation mean? You can't have a central government wonk going, you are going to do X, Y, Z, right? Adaptation is very local. It's about which cliff face should not be used. Which areas of our floodplain should we think about differently? Where should we put infrastructure? What should we raise? What should we not raise? Where should we try and get people to move away from? Those are very local and specific conversations. And the reason I mention this is because, as I said before, central government is very good at centralizing the dollars and very good at localizing the difficult stuff. When it comes to adaptation, it will be localized significantly. And we simply do not have the resources and tools to be able to do it well, but we must. Because the alternative of not dealing with it is we create ghettos, we create problems in our societies that are really quite intractable. Now, I won't dwell on this, but I just wanted to just sort of just understand the wider context of what's happening in the insurance front. Already we saw the rates of insurance falling away. So when it comes to dwelling insurance, something like 90% something like of houses in New Zealand are insured across New Zealand. But when you slice and dice by income, that story changes completely. Right? So yes, it's true that we are highly insured as a country, but what you'll find is that that insurance quite often is in combined insurance policies. And mo the insurance that most people hold is for their car. Because you must, right? You've got to have third party, otherwise when something happens, you're in trouble. <clears throat> but if you look at who gets insured, rich people practically 100% insured, poor people about 70% insured, but most of the 70% is their car, their content, and all those kinds of things are not insured. So there is big differences in the way that people do things. So you can see that low income households are spending about two grand a year on their insurance for their entire house. Quite often it'll be two, three cars, right? So two grand is only gonna buy you insurance for your car. It's not gonna buy you insurance for anything else. And all I'm trying to explain to you is that when this insurance costs increase and our insurers become more picky about what they will insure, guess who's gonna pay the cost? Guess who will be excluded? Guess who will wear the brunt of the next crisis when it happens? And what if there is no socialization of this cost? What if society doesn't want to go, I want to bail you out because you didn't have insurance? Right? At the moment, that's what's happening, right? In Auckland, for example, after the floods we had, uh, we bailed out people, with, rich people, with their houses, right? Renters, yeah, bugger off. <clears throat> Don't care about you. But if you had a home that got flooded and can't be rebuilt for whatever reason, and there were lots of complex reasons, they got bailed out. Right? So how many times can you do that? It's going to cost. Aucklanders a billion dollars, and it's going to cost all New Zealanders, New Zealanders another billion dollars to bail out Auckland's flood. One flood. And it wasn't that big in the context of things. So I'm really quite concerned about what's going to happen as a consequence of this. So like I said before, you know, when you see these natural disasters, the solutions are absolutely there. We are actually bloody good in crises. We really band together. We help each other out. We're good people. I love that. And then we forget about it. It's ad hoc. We've done bailouts, we've collectivized losses, but I don't think we can keep doing it because that fiscal chart I showed you, we're gonna be running out of money at some point in time. And the lack of systemic response is what we have to think about. If it's not gonna happen in Wellington, it has to happen here. How do we become anti-fragile to be able to deal with that? So what do we do? I think a lot of it is we know what to do. It's kind of like the tools are pretty obvious. It's we know what kind of things we do. But the ultimate goal is around changing of social norms, which is really hard, right? Because really what we're saying about what do we band, band together on to be able to do things? And we really have to try and change political views across the spectrum. And it's really hard to do, right? Can you imagine trying to get all those people in our political parties to agree on how we do things? And I think there's a whole bunch of strategies. There's some individual stuff and there's some collective stuff. Fundamentally, I think the individual stuff is easy to say, but it's not effective. You can be the best person there is, but if we don't do things in a collective way, we're not gonna get sufficient change and sufficient um, um, movement that's sustained. So I, I won't go into that, but I think for me, a lot of it is kind of the backdrop to why we're talking about economic development and why we're talking about it in a local setting because I don't think this is gonna happen at a national level. I don't think we're gonna see the leadership that's sustained over a number of decades to be able to deal with the changes and challenges that are coming at us over decades. And the costs will be borne by our communities, it's our families, it's our relatives who will be affected by it. So when it comes to the purpose uh, implications for economic development, it's really around um, purpose and clarity. So one of the things that a um, lot of governments around the world use is um, the donut, uh, Kate Worth donut economics, I don't know if you've seen it. 
it's, it's, it's like the main thing is it's just saying stop breaking things. You know, it's not, it's the trade off between environment and jobs is not real. In, it's dishonest to say that that's the case. And that's all that does. It's a really good tool. And so it doesn't have to be this tool, but use some tool to be able to show the impact of our decisions across all the things that we all care about. And if we're not able to do that, what we'll find is inevitably we go down to the dollar value. What makes us the biggest amount of money? What creates the most jobs? Which are OK, but are not enough. The consequence of why we had the, uh, the, the issues with the cyclone were not just because there was a cyclone. It was because of what we had also man chosen to do on economics in the past. So <clears throat> I did a little bit of work for Tuhui last year. It was a really small piece of work. But it was a really interesting piece of work, which was about going, why does Tuhui always clash with central government? Now, there's lots of jokes about that. And I think you might have views about that too. But the reality is, when I really unpacked what they meant by things like economic development, and this is a very specific case, right? So like, why is it that when we talk about economic development, you actually say different things to what we say? You mean different things with the same words. And part of that was because even the starting point of what we pictured as success looked different. So I had an illustrator who was in the room when I was doing these presentations, and she, she drew it up in terms of, OK, what do you think success looks like? And so when we had a group of our Wellington people uh, come up with a picture, this looked like, the success looked like this. When we talked to a good cross-section of the community in Tanya Tua, they came up with that picture of what success looks like. All I'm trying to get across is what success looks like is different for different people. We're not all driving to the same goal. We use the words. We say the words. We say that we're together. But actually, even those words mean different things. So we're not actually aligned on what we're trying to achieve. We're not actually aligned on our purpose, on our goals, and our ways of doing things. So when that happens, is it any surprise that when we try and work together, we come at cross purposes? Is it any surprise that we find it difficult to make change? Because actually, we are driving to different destinations, right? And our words mean different things. And that makes it really, really difficult. So the reason I say that this was work for Tuho is because I don't want to speak on behalf of everybody. Right? But I don't think the principles are any different. I think principles are much the same. Our ideals, what counts as tikanga, is similar across all the different iterations. So you know, there are big differences in terms of what, what's weighted. You know, what's the relative importance of the whenua in, the, in Tuhoi's tikanga view versus what our Wellington, central Wellington colleagues think? And the reality is that when it comes to the environment and the land, that's seen as subservient mm -hmm. to the needs of people rather than that is the basis for life. They're quite different things. Can you see that? So when we're starting from these underlying assumptions that are so freaking different, how do we even talk to each other? We use the words. We talk about economic development, but we actually mean different things. So I can't emphasize this enough, that when we talk about purpose, we are really agreed on what that means really, really important that we agree on what that means. And we're really clear and articulate and together on this. Because otherwise, that's where the division starts. Right at the beginning, our picture of success is different. So because I'm a complete geek, I wanted to show you this. Right? This is kind of how I think about the economy on the left-hand side. Right? This is what I was taught when I went to university. Economic activity is economic returns through the ownership of assets and labor. Right? So essentially, if you think about things like GDP, it's the profits of businesses and wages of workers. That's really what GDP is, right? But when I went to Tuhoi, they said, well, actually, it's about economic outcomes, which is much wider than profits and wages. It's about economic outcomes through the use and stewardship of resources, which are not fungible. So you can't take you know, a bit of pollution on the sea and make it good with some tree planting over there and call it good. Yeah? Defiling the planet on one side and fixing it up on another are not trade-offs you're still doing bad things here. So they're not fungible. And you know, in economics, we are taught very clearly that property rights are everything. Your legal rights is what gives you the ability to extract maximum value from those things that you have. And when, I went to, uh, when you think about Tikanga, the ordering is different. It's upside down. It's responsibilities first, right? It's about the responsibilities. So it's enabled by responsibilities and privileges. And 
you know, the words are not the same because it's very difficult to translate those Te Ao Maori concepts into English because we just don't have parallels that, that contain all the bits that go with it. You know, the, the etymology of the words just don't have that content. We don't even have parallels for these words. So we will always struggle to translate these things. But the reason why I talk about it is this, this, uh, this turning over of the triangle. Responsibilities first, rights later. And it's not even rights in this case. And we always talk about the collective as a sum total of individuals. And this really started from the Enlightenment stage in Europe, right? So the Enlightenment thinking was we, ha we are rational beings and individuals in sum total is the community. That's not true. That's bullshit. Individuals succeed because there is an enabling community. Right? I mean, that is fundamentally true of any ancient civilization that you see. All civilizations start with enabling societies. And yet that rational thinking, that rational thought process is very fundamental to how we think about the economy. That it is benefit for the self which equal, equates to social benefit. But the tu, tu, Tuhoi and the Tikanga approaches first has to be for the benefit for the whole which allows the individual to thrive. Very different perspectives, right? Very different perspectives into ordering of what comes first and what causes what. And what we do, like as, an, as, a, you know, as a, for what I do for a living is I count up the things that move, right? How many people have a job this time? How much money did you spend? Who didn't spend money? All that kind of stuff. It's bloody exciting. I love it. <laughs> but the reality is I've got this kind of, you know, if there's, a, if there's a river going past you, I'm looking at the river as it goes past me. That's all I care about. It's the water running past me. Right? The flow of the water is what matters. But when you think about the Tikanga approach, yes, the flow matters. But where did the water come from? What's its history? And where does it go? It is the whole river. And they're actually quite different things. One is about thinking about the economy as a slice in time, and the other one is thinking about the economy and society that encompasses time. And they're very different things because it's impossible to measure. And because we can't measure it, we go, oh, no, that's too hard, so we won't do that. Right? And that is really, really hard. So the other thing that we do in economics, and I think we're guilty of a lot of things as economists, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we do is when we do a business case, we say that future costs and benefits will be discounted. Right? Literally, we say, if there is a benefit in the future, that's not worth much to me. Literally, we bake this into the way we do things. We are so selfish. We have baked it into our way of making decisions that say, if there is a benefit in the future, it is not worth much to me, so we should not do it. That is exactly how we set things up. We discount the future costs and the future benefits, and that's why we don't take action on climate change. Because those actions will pay dividends for generations 100 years out not for me. But if you look at the big infrastructure and the good things that we enjoy, when were they built? A hundred years ago. Because those generations didn't go, oh, fuck it, I'm not going to do it because <laughs> it's not for my benefit. They went, no, we're going to do it because it's for <laughs> my benefit and my kids' benefit and their kids' benefits. And you've got to have that long term in your sights because so many of the decisions we make are going to hang around forever. We have legacies to live. And we've got to think really carefully about what kind of legacy do we leave and what footprints do we want to leave behind. And right now, when you take a selfishness perspective, when we're discounting the future, by definition, every single business case, right? And anybody who works in government will tell you, we literally go there and go, the future is worth less. Can you, can you imagine that? I think this is telling me that I've had enough time. So I started with this, this, this picture, right? And I started with this picture because I told you that when you think about the purpose of government, it's about gates, ladders, and unity. And it's the same for economic development. None of the things we do in life are very difficult, right? Don't do bad stuff, do more good things, and do it together. That's pretty much the essence of government. That's the essence of economic development. That is the essence of making good policy. And it is about averting what is bad, welcome and boost what is good. But it's this, this is the bit that's really hard to do. How do you create the coordination and cohesion, that unity and consensus? Because if we're not driving together, how will you make sustained change for things that are really hard and things that will benefit somebody you don't even know? It's a really hard one. It's a really hard one. These words are really easy to write. It's really hard to put in practice. So when you're thinking about a regional plan, when you're thinking about economic development, when you're thinking about local government, it's this bit that we're trying to do really well. This stuff is easy. We've got experts who can tell you what's bad and what's good and what policies you should write. I'm not saying they'll be adopted, but I think we've got people who can do that. This is the bit that creates good, long-lasting outcome.
And you can only do that through conversation with trust and the ability to bridge divides. Yeah, really hard stuff, particularly in the current environment. So when it comes to economic development, um, it's a really hard game. It's a really hard game because local government is actually a tiny part of the economy. Local government spends around 2.5% of GDP, and economic development is, you can't even see it. It's that big. So what we are asking of local government can't be that you're just going to spend the money and everything will be better. Yeah? That's not what economic development is about. Economic development is about, going back to my previous picture, is knowing where we're heading, that our goals are clear, that we're united on what success means, and we're going to last the distance. And I use this picture a lot because this is, uh, this is like government 101, right? Most people think the way that government do things is by control, right? Those punitive approaches. We can regulate, we can tax, we can make you do things or not do things, right? And the fear of punishment, for example. Again, very prominent in uh, rational thinking in that enlightened period, that it was all about, you know, that, that very Hobson view that, uh, you know, before rational thinking, life was brutish and short and terrible, and it's so not true, right? All the indigenous knowledge from around the world shows that it's absolutely not true. And yet, that is something that, that's some truth that we think is that somehow control is the main purpose of government. It is. There's a whole bunch of things that governments can do. But economic development and what we do in our own regions quite often is about influence and engagement, about good design, and helping people develop the things that are right. So all I'm trying to explain to you is that when you think about your role, don't jump to what money do I spend. Don't jump to what regulations do we implement. Also think about how do we create those other, use those other levers, which are not very easy to see the end goal and the end outcome, but these are the things that actually create long-term lasting value. That unity that I talked about, the unity doesn't happen from people telling you what to do. The unity happens on this bit of the thing on the left-hand side. It's around the co-design, it's around the influence, it's about listening to people. It is much, much harder and much harder to do. But I would encourage you to think about the purpose of economic development, the purpose of our economic strategy, the purpose of what we do is quite often not going to have the direct line of sight of what we do and what, is ha what happens as a result. Sometimes it's going to be quite spongy. It's going to be things that we're influencing and designing, getting people together. Because you know what? Our regional vision, our regional purpose, our regional outcomes, we're going to be here for 100 years. The government's only going to be there for three years. Right? Any government is only there for three years. So we've got to think beyond those uh, timelines. So these are the key messages that I thought I'd leave you with in terms of economic development. I've given you a very big perspective on, um, I guess, the, the storms, the economic context of Tarafiti. But to me, when we think about economic development, it's about development but not growth. And it's really important you don't confuse what we're trying to do. It is not about growth per se. It's actually about making our society better. And you've got to decide what that's, that better looks like. And you've got to agree that you, you know what that better looks like. Because you know what? Nobody else can come and tell you what to do about that. When it comes to new responsibilities, um, the real challenge is when you ask your economic development agency or your local government or somebody else to do something, don't just add it on to all the other things. Stop something else or create new funding. Give them some new tools. Because the reality is that most of these organizations are not big enough to be able to do more, more, and more. You've got to have clarity of purpose, funding, and resourcing to be able to do that well. I think we've got to be really clear about the, uh, the power and capacity that we have. And I would encourage you to think about how much of our power is so strong in that community building phase and so weak when it comes to forcing central government to do things. Right? So you've got to just figure out where on that uh, spectrum we sit on those various different things and really pull the levers that we can do things better. So when we think about economic development, this is my message to economic development agencies around the country, is it's fundamentally about how we think about things. You've got to have the clarity of purpose. It's about how we spend our money and resources, because then we can figure out these are the things that are really critical for my community, and we are just going to keep doing this year in, year out, until we have achieved them. And it's about how we make decisions. Our decision making cannot be centralized. It cannot be removed from community. Gates, ladders, and unity. We can do the gates and ladders really, really quick, but if we want to have success, and if we want to take people with us, and if we want to have lasting impact, that last bit, which is about taking people with us, is the most critical part. I'll leave you with this one last picture. It's very hard to imagine a new future, because quite often, when we think about plausible futures, 
we are weighed down by history. But we know that the present is telling us that something's not right. How we did, did things is not going to deliver better outcomes. And then there is the pull of the future. They're saying, be brave, be bold, think differently. What I'd encourage you to do is just park your skepticism or your uh, uh, weight of history. Don't let how we did things in the past be the guide for how we do things in the future. The reality is we got here for a reason by doing things in a particular way. And that way is not the way of the future. Thank you.